It is now my great honor to introduce a true friend of ICFSO, CPSC Acting Chairman of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, Bob Adler. Bob has been Acting Chairman since October 2019 and has been a Commissioner at the agency since 2009. His term ends in October of this year. Bob is no stranger to most of our attendees who have had the privilege of hearing him as both a keynote speaker and as a panelist talking business ethics in senior safety, among other subjects during past ICFSO conferences. We pre appreciate the time Bob takes out of his schedule for ICFSO and for also allowing us to have Shelby Mathis as our ex official board member of our board. Further, we can't thank Bob and CPSC senior leaders enough for their continued participation in our CPSC morning, which was started initially by ICFSO founding member, David Smeltzer, as a way to break down the barriers between regulators and the regulated entities. True to Dave's vision 28 years ago, CPSC continues to train, educate, and network at our conferences, whether in person or virtual as we are today. Acting Chairman Adler, the speaker box is now yours. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to appear before you today, even if we're doing it virtually. Uh, it's been a rough year on multiple fronts, but I'm hopeful that 2021 will be much happier and healthier for all of us. So at the outset, I'd like to recognize and thank a number of folks for putting together such a wonderful conference in the face of numerous pandemic challenges. And as always, I first uh, note Mark Schoem, who I think has been the executive director of ICFASO for five and a half years, and that's been five and a half years of superb leadership. So Mark, thank you for all of your wonderful work. And Rick Rosati, uh, ICFASO president, it's been a tough year uh, and you've performed extremely well. So thank you for all of your good efforts. Uh, Andy Church, who's been the symposium planning chair and is the incoming president of ICFASO. Andy, I look forward to getting to know you. Uh, and I have to thank Erin Cole, who is ICFSO's meeting manager. Uh, she's helped get me through a lot of the technical challenges that I uh, ineptly have uh, created for myself. The problem is computers do what I tell them to, not what I want them to do. And that's been a huge challenge. So thank you, Erin. Uh, and I have to thank Shelby Mathis, who is CPSC's small business ombudsman. Uh, she is the uh, liaison to ICFASO, and she's done just a magnificent job as always. So Shelby, thanks. And I'd like to take a moment, just a quick moment for a personal comment. And that has to do with David Schmelzer, uh, who passed away very recently. Most folks who've been involved with ICFASO have known David over the years. Uh, he's been one of the staunchest uh, and most dedicated supporters of ICFASO. And I think that's helped make this such a tremendously successful organization. Uh, I met David when I was at CPSC, even before he came to the agency. And I do remember that first meeting in which I said, this is one of the sweetest, most dedicated uh, and uh, smartest people that I had met. Uh, and it was a pleasure to know him. I also have to admit that I loved it when he regaled us about stories of his childhood in Brooklyn. And that was a tradition that, uh, to my delight, uh, I continued when I came back to CPSC. Uh, David and Alan Shaken, former employee at CPSC, and I used to get together at the Pines of Rome and gossip, but talk about the good old days. And of course, David always had a million Brooklyn stories. So uh, I just want to pay tribute to him, and I want to urge folks to consider giving to the David Schmelzer um, scholarship fund to help folks attend and participate in ICFASO activities. I think that's a very worthwhile uh, activity. Okay, so today I'd like to provide an update on developments at CPSC uh, for the past year and to discuss some of the challenges we face in the upcoming year. But first, a quick personal update. Uh, I think most of you know, but in case not, I still plan to retire at the end of my term in October. I will have been at the commission as a commissioner for 12 years. Uh, now there's a possibility that I might spill into my holdover year, but uh, I'm actually looking forward to leaving the CPSC in good hands uh, with a permanent chair and a full complement of commissioners. And it dawned on me 
I've spent almost 50 years working at, overseeing, or writing about CPSC. Uh, and those have been great years. But I'm going to be 77 years old when my term expires. I realize that means I'm too young to be president, but I think I've uh, put in enough years. I think it's time to hang up my safety spurs and to move on. Uh, and my intention is to do some teaching and writing about topics that interest me, always product safety, but also ethics and negotiation. Uh, some of you may recall last year, under different circumstances, when I spoke to ICFASO, I used a metaphor, and that was caretaker uh, because I'd just become the acting chair. I felt committed to maintaining a degree of continuity at the agency, uh, given my status as acting chair. And so we awaited the arrival of a new chair, and we awaited some direction from on high, uh, neither of which occurred. So... We didn't sit idly by. I think we worked and we achieved, and I think we got a lot accomplished. So anyway, here we are 16, 16 months later, and we have a new administration. And I think it's fair to say they view product safety in different terms. So I'm going to modify the metaphor from caretaker to gardener. So what does that mean? Well, first and foremost, it means to me that CPSC must break free from the prison of incremental budgeting that has plagued us for decades. In fact, for all of our existence. Every gardener knows that nothing can flourish without rich soil. And goodness knows we've been planting in poor soil for our entire existence. So I have profound hope. And that is, instead, instead of having our OMB friends and our appropriators simply look at our existing budget add a few dollars to it sometimes, which by the way, doesn't always cover our increased costs uh, from pay increases and in inflation. It's my hope that they'll understand that we have a strong need for an exponential increase in funds in order for us to do our job well. And I'm gonna make a few points of comparison to illustrate that. I think you've all read that CPSC has jurisdiction over 15,000 product categories. I've never counted them, but it's a massive amount of product categories. Uh, it may well be the broadest jurisdiction of any federal health and safety agency. It's just not clear, but it's a massive and broad jurisdiction. Uh, the one thing that's indisputable is that with our budget of $135 million, we are by far the smallest of any of the federal health and safety regulatory agencies. Uh, in other words, we're the poster child for start poor, stay poor. Uh, and I'm not sure to laugh or cry when I look at some of the other agencies and their budgets. Uh, consider our sister agency, FDA. Uh, they, they have a budget that's 44 times what CPSC's is. And by the way, this was before COVID arrived. Uh, they claim on their website to be a bargain for the American public at an expenditure of about $10 a person. And mind you, they are a bargain. But if FDA is a bargain, then we're a steal since CPSC costs about 40 cents per person. Uh, and let me compare us to another sister agency with a budget closer to ours, NHTSA. They still weigh in at about a billion dollars a year, which is roughly seven times larger than CPSC's budget. And I'm not going to get into gruesome detail, but if you look to see the number of uh, annual deaths uh, that, and injuries that they must address, uh, CPSC's uh, fatalities and injuries uh, is larger. Um, in fact, it's not only larger than NHTSA, it's larger than OSHA or the Mind Self Mind Safety and Health Administration, uh, which I guess some people call MESHA, but it's a, a broader set of injuries and fatalities than almost any of the other federal health and safety agencies, all of which have bigger budgets than CPSC. And yes, I know FDA is dealing with 500,000 deaths, which is why I'm not comparing us to FDA in that respect. I'm not criticizing the funding of other agencies. I think that's money well spent. But what I want to say is there's no good reason for CPSC to be on such a starvation diet. So I finally got tired of searching for pennies under our cushions. So as one commissioner, one commissioner, 
I just sent a letter to the Office of Management and Budget asking for a budget to me that's more closely aligned with the demands of the 21st century. To me, that demands requires a budget of roughly $280 million with a one-time infrastructure adjustment cost of roughly $90 million. Wow. Uh, if that sounds aggressive because it's more than doubling our current budget, I'm going to ask you to consider this. Even if we were to get every penny that I think we need, we would still be the smallest health and safety regulatory agency in the federal government. In other words, I think it's long past time for Congress to properly prioritize uh, product safety. Uh, the victims of product safety mishaps, far too many of whom are children, deserve a future in which the agency is funded appropriately to prevent more tragedies like theirs. So what would we do with the added resources? Oh my gosh, lots of things. But to begin with, we'd tackle the unfunded mandates. Let me repeat that, unfunded mandates that were recently given to us in the Omnibus COVID Relief Act that's now in law. I call that COVID-1. These include projects like uh, expanding our import resources, developing a standard for flame arresters for portable fuel containers, implementing an upholstered furniture standard, TB117, and studies and reports on carbon monoxide detectors. In other words, a bunch of extra work, not an extra penny to uh, do that work. I know everybody, or at least I assume everybody's following the new COVID Relief Act, the $1.9 trillion, which I call, Bill, which I call COVID-2, that's pending before Congress. There is a provision in COVID-2 uh, that if it passes would provide funding to cover the added responsibilities given to us in COVID-1. Uh, and boy, will I be grateful for that, but I need to emphasize uh, that added funding comes with some limits on uh, what we can do with the money and it still won't solve, solve our ongoing perennial budget problems. Uh, and let me just point to our uh, recently approved FY21 operating plan. To me, that's as ambitious as anything I can recall in my years as a commissioner. Uh, it has lots of projects for mandatory standards. Uh, and let me just mention a few of these. Infant sleep products, crib mattresses, crib bumpers, clothing storage units, also known as dressers, carbon monoxide hazards uh, from portable gas generators and from furnaces, high power magnets, table saws, window coverings, and that's not addressing the uh, issues of chronic hazards from things like organohalogen flame retardants, possibly crumb rubber, and maybe PFAS coming down the pike in the future. In other words, it's a massive and ambitious workload uh, and if we're going to do that, we also have to pay attention to my favorite approach to solving safety problems, which is voluntary standards. And let me just mention some of the dozens of voluntary standards projects that we've got. Booster seats, child resistant packaging, carriages and strollers, infant bathtubs, battery fires, clothes dryer fires, flammable refrigerants, liquid laundry packets, and on and on. And of course, depending on the progress of these voluntary standards uh, or the lack thereof, any of those could turn into mandatory standards proceedings and by the way, vice versa. Anyway, if we're gonna address these priorities in a timely and effective manner, we're gonna need additional resources for epidemiology, engineering, health sciences, human factors, law and elsewhere. In fact, everywhere. So, uh, I'm trying to be as transparent about what I consider the agency's budget plight as I can. I'm hopeful that it will resonate with our friends and stakeholders who've worked with us over the years and garnered their support. Anyway, let me continue building on my gardening metaphor. So if resources are the soil, the agency still needs careful tending. As I see it, that means we need at least two significant legislative changes that would make the agency function as it should. You're not gonna be surprised to hear me say the first of these is to unshackle the agency from the information criticisms, uh, excuse me, the information muzzle found in section 6B of the CPSA. 
I'm not going to repeat the many criticisms I have of 6B because I suspect most people in this audience have heard them before. But I do want to say that year after year after year, I've heard the concern that if 6B were abolished, we'd be left with an agency that would run rampant with misinformation about companies. That's the concern. Let me address that concern, and I'm going to be very blunt. I'm not sure it's any more real than Bigfoot. Somehow, every other agency in the federal government manages to function fairly and fully without restrictions similar to those in Section 6B. And by the way, it's not the agency that suffers. It's the public that suffers from limits or watered-down releases of safety information. It's to protect the public. The other legislative change we need is what I would call pruning, to continue the metaphor. We really need less cumbersome rulemaking of the sort that was added to our statutes some 40 years ago, and that has resulted in a massive slowdown in agency rulemaking. I re remember the claims that were made. These procedures, these mandatory findings would produce better rules. Well, I think 40 years of history show that all they've done is produce fewer rules, not better rules, not rules with uh, any observable improvements, just slower rules. And slower rule development means uh, more injuries and more fatalities to the public. So anyway, that said, I wanna be clear. If we don't get the funding, if we don't get the change to our statutory requirements, obviously we're gonna uh, work uh, and uh, move on. We're gonna do as many safety standards, we're gonna do as many port inspections, recalls, uh, voluntary standards collaboration, warning and educating the public. We're gonna do all of that as much as we can. Uh, in fact, we're gonna use every option we have to make consumers safer. Uh, which includes using our dedicated compliance enforcement team to their fullest extent. And I must say, I'm delighted uh, that with the reorganization of compliance enforcement, we are working much more effectively, efficiently, uh, and expeditiously. And let me drop a special note here. I'm proud to say that uh, after what I thought was an unnecessary hiatus of several years, we begun seeking civil penalties again which has culminated in two recent penalty settlements. Uh, and by the way, I'm proud, not because we're in the business of racking up uh, civil penalty counts uh, or adding those uh, as pelts on the wall. Um, and this is where my uh, esteemed colleague, Commissioner Biaco, correctly reminds me that's we're not in the business of just piling up uh, civil penalty settlements. We do it because if they're done thoughtfully, civil penalties are a necessary part of any properly run enforcement agency. And by the way, I feel the same way about unilateral press releases and administrative litigation. They're tools that have been given to us that we're obligated to use when the need arises and that we will use. So is that all that's going on? No, there's more. Our communications team, of which I am extremely proud, has been doing terrific work. They continue to deliver great advice and safety information in the form of education campaigns. Uh, they've done clear and urgent and well-drafted recall announcements, and they continue with the social media memes <laughs> that I still don't really get, but everyone assures me they not only have of a cult following, but they're very effective. Uh, but that continues, and I'm proud of them. Uh, also, our research and standard setting staff, known to insiders as EXHR, continue to test products, analyze data, draft uh, regulatory proposals, and they manage to do so even during the dark and early days of the pan pandemic lockdown when we had to reduce staff access to our lab. And I just wanted to make one quick announcement because folks have been asking this of us a lot. Uh, National Consumer Protection Week is coming up in March. So one of the highlights of that for us is we're going to release a snapshot uh, from NICE, National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, that a lot of people have been requesting. And that's going to compare injury data from March through September of 2020 to the same months 
uh, pre-pandemic to highlight what the effects of the pandemic are. I've sort of alluded to those, but this will be a much more detailed picture that will show in some areas where injuries and fatalities may have increased and other areas where they've decreased. And of course, because of COVID, we know there are many fewer visits to emergency rooms. At any rate, that will be published during uh, National Consumer Protection Week. And we're gonna continue mining that data to see whether we need to take additional steps to protect consumers during the pandemic crisis. So uh, just to round out the metaphor, uh, I hope we garden this agency the way Matt Damon grew potatoes on Mars in the movie, The Martian, which I loved. We're gonna take what little we have and we're gonna use every tool at our disposal to get the job done. I'm gonna digress for just a second to mention two additional uh, priorities that are not directly safety related, but I think are absolutely key to an effective agency. Uh, the first is diversity. And I don't just mean that our little agency should look more like the American people we serve. We must do that. I mean that we have to take every opportunity to approach product safety from a variety of diverse viewpoints. For example, some important questions. How might certain hazards exist for some vulnerable populations more than others? How might real life barriers like socioeconomic status affect our safety messages and people's ability to respond to them? What methods can we use to reach marginalized and underserved communities? It's asking and answering these questions where the crucial work of diversity is done. And that's what we're committed to doing. In fact, for this year's uh, mid-year priorities, and I must say under the gentle prodding of my colleague, Commissioner Kay, I've directed staff to present ideas that continue to expand our longstanding commitment to diversity. So please stay tuned. The second key component to a properly, fun properly functioning agency, and I think a key to our success, and this isn't gonna surprise anybody who knows me, is civility. Here, I wanna second something I heard President Biden declare a few weeks ago when he swore in a thousand new appointees to the federal government. In a nutshell, he said that if he ever discovered staff treating others with disrespect, he'd fire them on the spot. Needless to say, I love that degree of accountability and I hope he stays true to it. Uh, I too believe that we should always operate with civility and treat each other with respect. And it's something I've always tried to do and I've always insisted that people who work around me do. Uh, these are qualities that are extremely important to me and they should be to everyone who operates in the commission or with the commission. And now, because I've been there 50 years, I thought I would reflect a little bit uh, and share a few observations I have about product safety. So uh, I promise I won't dwell on all of them, but here are a couple. First, uh, as recent news would suggest, I think we're returning to a period in which people recognize that regulations, despite their faults and failings, can dramatically improve the nation's safety, well-being, and fairness. Granted, I'd never claim that all rulemaking's good, but I strongly object to the notion that it's always bad. Instead, I suggest society's constantly trying to balance two competing dynamics, markets that are imperfect versus regulation that is imperfect. That's the real world picture of regulation. But here I wanna inject a note of realism. Sorry folks, anyone who believes that markets always produce optimal societal outcomes without the need for regulation lives in a dream world where dangerous products, fraudulent practices, abusive monopolies, and climate change always sort themselves out in the long run. They don't. And please forgive a frustrated observation. I think I've made this before. I found that when folks that I consider to be free market ideologues encounter a regulation that by all accounts operates effectively, Invariably, they insist, well, it may work in practice, but it still doesn't work in theory. On the other hand, and let's be clear, even rules drawn with the best of intention and uh, the greatest of skill rarely come without costs and occasional unintended consequences. And here's a sad example. Uh, years ago, 
we discovered that our rule that was promoting reduced flammability for children's sleepwear led to the use of potentially toxic flame retardants, which undercut any safety benefits from the rule. That's the occasional unintended consequence of product safety. So in short, markets are flawed human institutions, despite occasional fantasies by some that they're divinely ordained. They're not. Similarly, regulations like all of us are human and fallible. Uh, and I did want to say, as I've learned over the years, the work of regulators is hard, endless, and anything but sexy. Uh, and for those who are content uh, to toil behind the scenes, uh, and I include myself in that group, I want to urge you to watch Bill Maher. He did a tribute to my former boss, Congressman Henry Waxman, on HBO, and it's on HBO January 30th, and you can all look it up. It's funny, it's moving, and it's spot on about the difference between being a workhorse and a show horse. Uh, so with those thoughts in mind, let me add that I believe, for the most part, safety rules have really been a great success story. And I said this at ICFASO last year. But when I reflect on decades of product safety regulation, I think extraordinary progress has been made across the board, and not just at CPSC. Uh, as I said at ICFASO last year, the U.S. population has increased uh, dramatically in the last 50 years. But if you look at fatalities from consumer products, they've plummeted. And I think that's due in large part, not entirely, but in large part to safety rules. And I remind you, we've seen uh, over an 80% reduction in childhood fatalities from poisoning. We've seen over a 90% reduction in crib fatalities and my favorite standard, the Refrigerator Safety Act, it still appears that we've seen a 100% reduction in deaths from kids climbing into abandoned refrigerators, closing the doors, and suffocating. So I do think safety rules have been very, very productive and helpful to uh, our society. Uh, there, that doesn't mean there's any cause for dropping our guard or reducing our efforts to promote product safety. Uh, frankly, as long as we have entrepreneurs who dream up new products, or we have chemists who develop new concoctions, uh, we're always going to have emerging safety hazards, and there's always going to be a need for an agency like Consumer Product Safety Commission. But here, I want to remind us all of what I call the great safety paradox. Namely, the more successful we are in reducing deaths and injuries, the less anybody notices Babies that don't suffocate in cribs or die from swallowing toxic prescription drugs never tell anyone that their lives were saved by a government regulation. And rarely do people recognize how profoundly safer they are than generations before. But we, and by the way, I include a lot of the folks in this audience at ICFASO uh, who are friends and stakeholders. The work that we've done to produce and advance safety we know what we've done. I'm extremely, extremely grateful to CPSC staff and to all of our friends at ICFASO who've worked to advance product safety. And by the way, there's a flip and it's a dark side to this paradox. Sometimes you don't get necessary safety measures until tragedy strikes and just reflect on this over the years. Uh, 146 young women died in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in 1911 in New York. Uh, and it wasn't until these ghastly deaths that were observed uh, by thousands and thousands of people that New York finally acted to promote fire safety and impose new building codes. And for those of us who remember uh, Dalcon Shield IUDs, uh, in the mid-70s, these left thousands of women sterile or with lifetime pelvic damage, and it wasn't until that scandal that Congress finally moved to enact medical device amendments of 1976. And of course, I want to remind everybody that the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act wouldn't have been passed in 2008 hadn't there, had there not been a flood of toys with high lead levels imported into the country. Uh, in short, Tragedies often lead to enhanced and overdue regulatory authority, and that's a hell of a way to promote safety. I keep saying there's got to be a better way. So it's my ongoing plea to the folks at ICFASO to work for safety reforms that don't 
stem from great national tragedies that are ghastly, that we all work to develop measured and effective safety uh, measures that, uh, that will protect the public. So in closing, I want to assure you that I'm going to be around for a while, uh, not until October and perhaps beyond, but I'm going to be doing my best to make CPSC the strongest, not so little agency that I can. But more importantly, you're going to have CPSC's incredibly dedicated staff that's going to continue to do what I consider superhuman efforts to protect all consumers. So I want to thank you for listening to my remarks, and I want to urge everybody to stay healthy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Acting Chairman Adler. I would now like to introduce Mary Boyle, who is the Executive Director of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Prior to her being Executive Director, Mary served in the Commission's Office of the General Counsel as the Deputy General Counsel. Mary, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here today at the annual ICFASO meeting. First, uh, I do want to extend my thanks to Andy and Mark Schoem and Rick Rosati for all of their efforts to make today possible. This is my third time addressing you in my capacity as executive director. And thinking about today's program, I reflected on my previous remarks. And I think at least one thing is clear. My tenure in this role has been anything but routine. The first time I addressed the group, we had just emerged from the longest government shutdown in history. And last year at this time, I mentioned that the agency had been touched by world events because our staff had been evacuated from the embassy in Beijing due to the coronavirus. Little did I know what would soon follow. Like all of you in your work lives and in your personal lives, this has been a challenging time for CPSC especially for staff who have experienced the devastating impact of COVID themselves and in their families. But through it all, I can report that CPSC staff has steadfastly kept its focus on fulfilling the CPSC mission and that we are operating full steam ahead. We are at the ports preventing violative products from entering our country. We are testing products at our world-class lab. We are developing rulemakings and recalling products. We are conducting investigations nationwide, and we are surveilling online platforms. We are holding webinars on important safety issues and communicating our message to wide audiences. The Small Business Ombudsman is fielding your calls and questions, and our Consumer Ombudsman is engaging with consumers in new and dynamic ways. In short, the CPSC is executing its mission robustly and vigorously. We may be doing some things differently, but we are doing them no less well and with no less of a sense of purpose or dedication. I am incredibly proud of the CPSC staff. In addition to the changes necessitated by the transition to remote work, last year also brought some other changes and new personnel whom I'd like to recognize today. As many of you know, Gib, Gib Mullen was affiliated with CPSC in one capacity or another for over two decades, and he retired as general counsel in January. Luckily for us, Jen Salt, in normal role as deputy director of compliance, graciously agreed to step into the acting general counsel position during this transition period. You will be hearing from Jen later as part of the Ask CPSC panel. In addition to the GC position, we also have a new head of the Congressional Affairs Office. Carla McGarvey, who has extensive experience working on Capitol Hill, joined the agency in January and she has hit the ground running. I'm also pleased to announce that we have made a number of changes at our laboratory to strengthen our staff there, including a new director for health sciences, Mary Kelleher. Mark Kumagai is now leading engineering sciences, and Caroline Paul has been named the new director of mechanical and combustion engineering. They are terrific additions to our leadership team and bring expertise and knowledge that is a crucial part of our science-based decision-making approach. So there has been a fair amount of change since I last addressed you. What has not changed, however, is our commitment to the agency mission and the execution of commission priorities. Those priorities are reflected in the agency's operating plan, which the commission approved in October. Acting Chair Adler 
touched on a number of the projects laid out in the plan, and you will be hearing in depth about some of these issues from our leadership team, who will be answering your questions during the Ask CPSC panel. But I would like to take a moment to highlight a few priorities. In the compliance area, priorities include a focus on increasing online surveillance and enforcement and strengthening the Internet Surveillance Unit, improving the Fast Track Program, expanding and strengthening the Enforcement and Litigation Division to support substan substantial product hazard investigations, administrative litigation, and civil penalty investigations, and focusing on regulatory enforcement in toy labeling, PPPA, bicycle helmets, durable nursery products, and ATV action plans. In the area of hazard reduction, priorities include improving the data quality of the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, a continued focus on protecting children, and to that end, we plan to complete proposed rules on furniture tip-overs, hazardous magnet sets, and window coverings, and final rules on infant sleep products, crib bumpers, and crib mattresses. We also are scheduled to complete an advance notice of proposed rulemaking on fire and debris penetration hazards in off-highway vehicles. And we are continuing work to improve our data analytic capabilities so that we can better identify emerging trends. And in the import world, staff is implementing the first stages of an e-commerce plan, including providing port staff dedicated exclusively to this issue. We are also implementing the recent statutory direction from Congress related to import surveillance, and we're developing plans to execute an e-filing program authorized by a unanimous vote of the Commission at the end of last year. As you can see, the agency agenda for the year is quite full and covers a wide range of issues. Staff is energized by this important work and is committed to keeping consumers safe despite the challenges we all continue to face as a result of the pandemic. And as focused on this year's operating plan as we are, we are already making plans for next year. And that starts with the agency's priorities hearing, where the Commission invites stakeholders to share views on the agency's agenda and priorities for fiscal year 22. The hearing will be held virtually on April 7th, and I encourage all stakeholders to participate, either through oral presentations or by submitting written comments. Comments are due to the Commission by March 17th. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this morning. I'm so proud and fortunate to work with an amazing and dedicated group of CPSC staff, and I know you will find the following panels informative and thought-provoking, and I look forward to seeing you all in person next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. And now we will turn it over to our ex-official board member in CPSC Small Business Ombudsman Shelby Mathis to moderate our next session, Dynamic Communications with the CPSC. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Welcome to the Dynamic Communications with the CPSC. This is going to be a three-part session, and the first up is Joe Mardiak. Thank you, Shelby. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here to be able to tell you a little bit about what's been going on in communications at the CPSC. Our fundamental goal is to get reliable information out there and have it be accessible to our stakeholders and in a timely way. We wanna make sure that our outreach and our messaging gets to the affected populations, and in particular, the vulnerable communities. We do this through about 300 press releases about recalls, as well as 24 safety education campaigns. Well, let's take a look at last year just to see where we've been. And I have to say last year was arguably the best year ever for communications at CPSC. I wanna call out a huge thanks to our team, the communications team for the extraordinary effort that they made last year. I'm gonna throw out some numbers, but it's just to give you a flavor of what we're talking about. I'm gonna compare last year to the previous year. For example, social media is very important and our followers had been 10,000 the year before, last year 150,000. As far as engagements are concerned, and this is important, people reacting to our social media. Previously, it was one and a half million. Last year, it was 12 million. On some of our bigger campaigns, like the holiday safety, we went from 300 million impressions to 512, impression, 512 million impressions. And then we went from 6,000 engagements to 14,000 engagements. 
for the Super Bowl Anchor It campaign, we had gone from 6 million impressions to 475 million impressions. And we had gone from 700 engagements to 11,000 engagements. So you can see the effort that the team was making last year. And this is in spite of COVID, which caused us to change a lot of our plans. And we had to put a special campaign on for COVID with special checklists, with a website, with satellite media tours, and this continues on now. Well, last year we were focused on some innovative ideas. And what we wanted to look into was some paid social media advertising, the use of listicles, as well as the multimedia news releases. We used influencers last year in a big way. And then we also wrapped up a survey on our Anchor It campaign to find out really what the audience is saying. Are they getting the message? Do they like the way they're getting it? And are they doing something about it? We use that to inform the new PSA that we created. And that new PSA was innovative in the sense that we just used nanny cam video, real life situations with parents. Another innovation that we had last year was with our Pull Safely video, which will be coming out this year. And that is we put animation for the first time into the video. So that's some of last year, a snapshot. What about this year? Well, our priorities are similar. Innovation is at the top of the list. For the satellite media tour we just did on Anchor It, we involved a parent who had had a near tragedy be part of those interviews, 35 interviews she participated in. Uh, we did Spanish this year for the first time. We hadn't done it last year. We did paid advertising, again, on social media for the first time on this campaign. And we went from 4,000 engagements last year to 422,000 engagements. The impressions, last year to this year, it went from 3 million to 27 million. And here's a very interesting thing. We also used over the top approach to get the message out. What this means basically is on streaming platforms like Hulu, uh, NBC Peacock, Sling, or YouTube TV, when you're watching a show and there's a commercial, our PSA on Anchor It was running as the commercial. Now, we didn't embed it because of the content of the program. We did it because an algorithm told us who we could go to that was going to be watching. In other words, parents with young kids at home. In addition to them seeing it, and we had 1.3 million people see the PSA, when those same people then went on to the web to browse, an ad would come up to tell them about the Anchor It website. So it was a terrific new innovative thing that we tried. As far as our recall emails go, uh, they're a little wordy and they're a little difficult to read. And so we're going to be doing a revamp on the template and the design of it, basically, so that people can read it, get it, and do it. A key factor going into this year is going to be diversity. Now, last year, we tried to be diversified in the actors that we were using in our PSAs. This year, we're expanding on that. For example, with our social media, we've already included LGBTQ individuals as well as disabled individuals in our graphics. In our Pull Safely, we've been focused on the culture and the community and the messaging and the statistics that we have specific to that community. So we're looking to really expand on that. Spanish, again, will be a big bump up this year. All the paid social media advertising that we do in all the campaigns, one third of that will be dedicated to Spanish. And we hope to look into some other interesting ideas yet in this year. For example, perhaps doing some advertising in public transportation in some pilot cities and pilot communities where the dependence on public transportation in those vulnerable communities is immense. Now, we are also going to be working this year on our websites. Uh, the saferproducts.gov has already gotten a redesign and we're going to be doing a marketing effort on that later this year to get people to realize it and to use it. And finally, with the cpsc.gov website, I know there are things that need to be fixed on that. And we are doing a major redesign and rehaul, overhaul, if you will, of the website this year. Why? To make it more user friendly, to make it more searchable uh, for the business education page, for example, to make it more organized and easier to browse and to make it also even more so mobile friendly. Those are some of the activities we've got planned for this year. And I, I have to say with a great team, I think we're gonna hit a lot of these right out of the park. Well, uh, to help us get the message out there, the new consumer ombudsman is there to help us get these messages from OCM out to the public and to a larger network of the public. And so I yield back the balance of my time as they say in Congress, 
and I recognize the kind gentleman from Maryland, Jonathan Midget. Thanks very much, Joe. It's always a pleasure to uh, address ICFA. So I know everybody here in the audience is uh, interested in public health and safety, so it's like preaching to the choir. It's just a marvelous opportunity. I want to talk uh, this morning uh, about uh, the benefits of having the consumer voice represented in your industry, your voluntary standards activities. So as the, the new consumer ombudsman, uh, my job, my mission is actually to bring the consumer perspective uh, to the agency and the agency's perspective to consumers. So I, I cannot uh, uh, tell you how valuable the consumer perspective is to making voluntary standards. Consumers bring real world experiences to the table. They have uh, insights into the critical incidents that are driving the conversations that we have in voluntary standards development. The critical incidents, uh, are, that's uh, human factors jargon for the incident that's really changing the discussion and, and, and driving um, uh, changes that make the world a better place. So consumers help experts understand uh, foreseeable use and foreseeable misuse in a way that, that perhaps the experts might not be able to, to, to voice. And consumers uh, also can explain how they expect their products to perform in everyday life. And, and those user expectations are, are, are dramatically helpful when you're, you're planning interventions to prevent injuries. Uh, so those insights bring some, some clarity to the discussion and they bring uh, some credibility too. Now you say, well, how, how do they make it more credible? Well, actually, next slide for me there, um, Shelby. Uh, having a balanced committee with all the stakeholders represented is a requirement. The U.S. standard strategy emphasizes openness and impartiality, uh, and it strives for uh, getting everybody who's involved in using a standard in the business of talking about how to make the standard better. And of course, everybody knows ANSI's essential requirements uh, call out balance as a very important principle we want all stakeholder groups to be balanced, and if, if we can't achieve perfect balance, we, we strive hard to, to reach it. Circular A119 is an executive branch document which tells of the high regard the U.S. government holds uh, for um, balance of interest in the, uh, the standards development process. Next slide. The trick, of course, is, is how do we get consumers involved because they're volunteers. It's hard to get volunteers. Uh, I recommend having an ongoing outreach uh, campaign with your voluntary standards uh, network. Make sure that people are always looking for someone who might be able to participate in that regard from the consumer groups. Uh, and you need to facilitate participation uh, using electronic collaboration tools for easy communications. Uh, one of the interesting um, outcomes of having a pandemic is people are becoming more uh, comfortable with uh, collaboration spaces such as we're using right now. And, and that's going to be only just better for uh, enhancing consumer participation in voluntary standards. It's just going to be uh, a, a real benefit. Uh, you need to quickly educate newcomers to the process in the jargon that, that is thrown around in a voluntary standards arena. And you need to have materials ready for them to learn about what's going on. And, and I, I, I can't um, emphasize how useful it is to have uh, a couple of mentors ready in the wings to to assign to a new consumer who's just learning the ropes, uh, mentors are incredibly helpful. And of course, monetary assistance is, is money well spent to get consumers to the table. And there, there are scholarships and grants available, we know, um, but sometimes the consumers don't know they're there and, and that, that can be a drawback for them for participating. Um, next slide. So what, uh, what can the consumer ombudsman at the CPSC do for you? Uh, so I'm available to help you find consumers uh, with my ever-expanding network of consumers and consumer groups. And I can provide basic information about standards to them and explanations of what's going on in the process in plain language. I'm an educational psychologist, so I can teach you anything. <laughs> I'm also building a portfolio of training materials that you will find eventually on my webpage, which is at cpsc.gov. And if you go to the top right corner of our homepage and pull down that hamburger menu, you will see basically all the main pages that we have for the, um, for the cpsc.gov and, and consumer ombudsman is listed there next to con uh, congressional affairs. I can also be a dedicated point of contact for consumers you have following the standard uh, contact to the agency. Uh, feel free to give my information to any consumers who are interested in participating in voluntary standards and I'll help any way that I can to help them to learn uh, what they can uh, do in that process and how they can help. 
And finally, I'll be engaging in my own outreach efforts to try and recruit consumers to the voluntary standards process uh, and hopefully uh, be able to enhance the balance that we have in the voluntary standards community right now. So I look forward to working with uh, everybody in the future. Uh, and now I think that we can turn the presentation over to um, Phil Burmel, our Fast Track Program Supervisor, and Shelby Mathis, our Small Business Ombudsman. Shelby and Phil, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And, um, you know, a good moderator would have started the session by saying, if you have questions, we're going to take them at the end and you can submit them via the ICFASO app. So please do so. Um, welcome. Uh, I'm Shelby Mathis. I'm the Small Business Ombudsman. And joining me this morning is Phil. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Phil Bermel. I'm the supervisor of the Fast Track Recall Team at CPSC. And uh, for the third part of today's session, we're going to talk about a, a bit of a preview of the Fast Track Portal update, which we are working on at the CPSC this fiscal year. Uh, and before we get started, a quick disclaimer, this presentation was prepared by CPSC staff and may not necessarily reflect the views of the commission. All right, so I'm hoping that this shows up somewhat well on your screen. Um, I, before we start talking about what the new system is going to contain, we thought we'd just start with a look at where we are and where we're going. On the left-hand side of your screen is the existing system. So if you are a firm that reports to the CPSC under Section 15B for a potentially hazardous product, then and you do so online, you're familiar with the system that shows up on the left-hand side of your screen. On the right-hand side of your screen is actually where we're going. And a few features that I'll highlight here um, just for our discussion, is the new system should look more streamlined to you. There's a menu on the left-hand side of that screen that is going to show you, hopefully you can see two green dots and then a yellow dot. The yellow dot is actually where you are in the process, and the gray dots are what's to come. So we're doing this so visually you're cued that you have a few more sections left before you can actually hit the submit button. Another benefit of the system on the right-hand side that we're working towards is we're going to have hover over text, which will show as a question mark. And there's a hazard description box that actually has a question mark and a pop-up that's showing to the far right. Those hover over text or question marks are meant to inform what we're actually looking for from you. So if you aren't sure when completing this, you can, do, you can hover over the text and it'll give you a bit more of a visual cue. So stopping so, sale continue. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say one thing that we've done is we've broken the system, uh, the existing system, which asks for the initial report information and the full report information into two separate segments. And the first part is the initial report. We'll still be asking for all the information that's shown on your screen, those check marks. And the good news is you'll have an opportunity to review all the content that you're about to submit to us and provide additional comments. Uh, to the CPSC before you submit. Uh, and this comes straight from our regulation that's cited on the screen. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Phil, who's actually gonna talk about kind of the meat and potatoes, more in-depth part of the online filing portal. Thank you, Shelby. So stopping sale continues to be a main requirement to participate in the Fast Track program. The new business portal will have the functionality of a guardrail checkpoint at this step. If the firm has not yet stopped sale, the firm will be unable to proceed forward submitting their fast track report in the new business portal without this requirement being met. Also new to the remedy section, we have added another guardrail checkpoint for the time frame that the remedy will be available to consumers, as well as requiring technical documents related to a repair or replacement to be submitted, which will ultimately streamline the time to recall. Templates of social media posting and press releases will be located inside of the new portal and will automatically pre-populate with information based on the firm's report, eliminating repetitive data input for users. Finally, instead of a single upload button in the attachment page, the new business portal will intuitively ask for only certain documents that are required depending on the type of recall. This will greatly enhance the attachment page functionality to more accurately fit the scope of the recall. De detailed templates will also be available on this page, and upload buttons will be located directly next to each required documents, 
providing users a clear roadmap for submission. In summary, a submission in the new business portal is done in two steps, initial report followed by additional information. The initial report process will be significantly simplified and will lessen the burden for firms to fulfill their initial reporting obligation. The improved business portal will also be mobile friendly, no longer requiring the use of a desktop computer. A PDF copy of your report will also be able to be easily downloaded at the end of the report submission as well. Finally, there will be auto-generated emails and reminders built into the system that will allow CPSC and the user to seamlessly communicate timeframe reminders and updates throughout the recall process. Back to you, Shelby. All right, so uh, with that, we're gonna open it up to questions. And um, we already have some questions, my fellow panelists. Um, Okay, so I, I've got one for Joe Murdia. It's about social media. Can you talk about the effectiveness of social media? Do you have ways to measure behavior changes beyond engagement on social media? That's a great question. Obviously, the most important thing is to start to attract them to it and then to inform them. And ideally, with the engagement numbers, that tells us they did something with it. They either retweeted it, they liked it, they forwarded it to someone else, and so they interacted with the message. As far as them taking the message and then implementing that safety feature, that's the rub. That's the challenge we have right now. And the best way to do that would be through either focus groups or through surveys. When we do surveys, it is a, uh, a costly as well as a time-consuming period, for example, the survey for Anchor, it took almost two years for us to get it cleared through OMB and get the thing moving, but it's incredibly important information. So we're gonna be looking into how can we tap into that somehow through informal focus groups or some other mechanism to actually find out, did people act on it? Now, I will say anecdotally, we do get people on social media who make a comment and then they say, for example, about recalls and signing up for them. Uh, one person signed up and then he, in his comment on, online, he said, and lo, lo and behold, he said, I've got this very product here sitting in my house that I just read about. So uh, that's when they tell us that they acted. But we need to find out a way to talk to them to see if they actually follow through. All right. Thank you, Joe. Uh, we've got another question, and this is actually about the Fast Track portal, and I will direct it to Phil. Um, the question is, will the new portal allow free text entries for explanatory text, reservation of rights, et cetera? So yes, the new portal will allow for free text entries. And what we've done here is focused on the specific questions where we feel that more explanation is, is necessary, is needed, and we've allowed you those free text boxes. We're not limiting you to 180 characters like Twitter or anything. We will provide you enough space there to adequately explain um, the situation, the remedy, the hazard, or things like that. We do have another question about the portal, and it is, uh, which I'll take, uh, it's will the new portal be easily exportable, such as to a PDF, or will it be proprietary like Health Canada's? Um, the answer is, it, it, if you're asking about whether or not your submission will be exportable, it will absolutely be exportable. You'll have the option, you know, we talked about um, at a high level, the system's gonna be broken into two parts, the initial report, those five pieces of information, and you submit then, and if you have the additional information, you can also submit that then. Uh, at each step, you will be able to download your submission before submitting it. You'll also, Phil talked about automated emails. You're also gonna get an automated email that will show you uh, what has been submitted and it will have that PDF there. Uh, so with that, I think we are up on our time. So I am gonna turn it back over to uh, the nice folks at ICFASO. Thank you so much to my fellow panelists and to everybody for your great questions. Me and the panelists. Next, we will hear from Rob Kay, the Director of Compliance and Field Operations, who will give an update from the Office of Compliance. Rob. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Thanks so much for, uh, for having me. Uh, I think I'm up here, although I still see some of our prior panelists. There we go. 
Uh, it's great to be here uh, to provide a, a compliance update. A few things I want to touch on uh, this morning, and then I'll also be available uh, for questions as part of the next panel. Uh, I want to follow up a little bit on uh, on what Phil and Shelby just presented with respect to the work that's ongoing with the new Fast Track portal. Uh, I also want to speak to uh, uh, the progress we've made in the uh, restructuring and compliance that we uh, introduced last year, uh, let folks know how that's going, and also walk through a little bit for those who are less familiar with compliance, how we are set up, and, and then finally also uh, address some additional changes we've made to uh, enhance our ability to address the continuing growth uh, of e-commerce. Uh, so, so first of all, with respect to the Fast Track portal, and I want to start off just by thanking Shelby and Phil as well, Blake, as well as uh, Blake Rose, who have been spearheading the development of the new portal. Uh, you know, this is really a project that is aimed to bring Fast Track, uh, you know, into the the 21st century, so to speak, uh, to put it on a technological platform. Uh, and move away from what I think in some respects is really more of an ad hoc process uh, right now. Um, I, I'd ask everyone to keep your eyes out for uh, a feedback session, which I'm sure will be virtual, that we're looking to uh, set up this spring, where we'll go into a little more detail of how the, uh, the Fast Track portal is shaping up and, and welcome your feedback. Uh, you know, one of the key attributes that we're aiming for here is really to make this a user-friendly system uh, that folks will look at uh, as being uh, easy to use and, and beneficial for, uh, for processing uh, these cases as expeditiously as we can. You know, a hallmark of the changes is to create greater standardization, particularly with respect to how uh, the information comes in, uh, making that less ad hoc. Uh, in the process, we'll be establishing a standardized starting point for fast track cases when we have you know, the, the core information that's needed to, to bring these ca uh, cases to recall quickly. Uh, and that's going to enable us, I think, to be more predictable about how long it will take to get these recalls out in the street uh, and, uh, uh, I think, better equip us to, to, uh, to help Fast Track live up to its name and, and, and get these cases out, uh, out quickly. Uh, uh, as Phil mentioned, uh, you know, there's going to be a number of bells and whistles that I think will streamline the process, including the pre-populating of information and certain documents like the press release document. Uh, and there will be added functionality to the extent that folks uh, also register as business portal users. You won't have to be a business portal user to use the new Fast Track portal uh, to get uh, to put your information in, to get email updates. Uh, and, and feedback, but there is some additional functionality that comes with being a business portal user. Uh, certain information will automatically populate that you've previously put into the portal, such as firm information. Uh, you'll get uh, updates on the progress and the predicted uh, date of release. You'll be able to see past submissions in the business portal. So there's some synergy there and some reasons why I think it makes sense to, uh, to consider being a business portal uh, registrant. Uh, but again, you won't have to be a business portal registrant to use the, uh, uh, the portal. Uh, so again, I, I think we're excited about uh, rolling this out, uh, going into the, the build out as the year progresses, uh, and hopefully uh, rolling this out uh, in, a, in a way that, uh, as I say, improves uh, the usability and brings us into uh, the 21st century with, with Fast Track. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about is, as I said, an update uh, with respect to uh, the, um, uh, some of the changes in compliance that we implemented last year. And I'll do that as I sort of walk folks through how we're set up, uh, especially for those of you that may not be familiar with uh, how we are organized in compliance. Uh, you heard from Phil, uh, who is our Fast Track supervisor uh, and works in uh, the purple group there on the left of the slide, our resource management division under uh, Blake Rose's leadership. Uh, uh, these are folks that support a wide variety of activities in compliance. Uh, of course, they, they manage the fast track program, but they do a lot more than that. They do a lot of data analysis and reporting in furtherance of our mission. Uh, they uh, monitor our performance metrics. They're also uh, taking on the leading role now in our recall monitoring, where we need to follow up on recalls after they've been issued. Uh, and so uh, a lot of important work uh, takes place in, in CRM. Uh, you know, the, the green uh, boxes there in the middle are where we made uh, a lot of our changes 
uh, as part of the restructuring last year. Uh, that's our new enforcement and litigation group under the leadership of Mary Murphy, who came to us from the general counsel's office. Uh, Howie Tarnoff, who many of you know, has been a mainstay in compliance for many years and is Mary's deputy, uh, as well as Leah Ippolito, who also came to compliance from the general counsel's office. Uh, you know, we've done a, a, a tremendous amount uh, of hiring in compliance. I think we've hired over 15 people in general over the last year, including nine uh, new compliance attorneys. Uh, for those of you who have, have uh, been engaged in, in hiring and onboarding over the past year in the COVID environment, uh, I don't think I need to tell you how challenging that can be. And I just couldn't be more pleased and proud of our staff uh, in the way that they've executed in the hiring process and brought some terrific folks on board, uh, you know, really made them feel part of the team and gotten them onboarded and, and gotten to work already. Uh, and I think that uh, the new division is really now just starting to, to hit their stride. I think there's more hiring to come. Uh, we're not exactly, we're not fully staffed to where we expect to be, uh, but we are already seeing uh, a lot of work getting done that, frankly, uh, a few years back, we just weren't as equipped uh, to do. And that really is a testament to the efforts, uh, among others, of, uh, of Mary, Howie, uh, and Leah. You know, th this new enforcement division, I think, in broad strokes, has three primary uh, responsibilities. Uh, one is to enhance our ability to handle complex investigations of substantial product hazards, cases that often can have uh, the most substantial impact on product safety uh, in a more efficient way, both for the benefit of consumers where action is necessary and also to the benefit of firms uh, uh, where uh, we can make decisions uh, you know, not to proceed when appropriate in an expeditious manner. Uh, and I think we're already starting to see uh, 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 great work uh, in that area. Uh, you know, the second uh, 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 priority for enforcement and litigation, which, which uh, Chairman Adler touched on in his remarks, uh, is our civil penalty program. Uh, you know, I, I'll start off by, uh, you know, along the same lines of what Bob was saying, that uh, you know, this is a program that is, is premised on the idea that there's just an enormous volume, uh, enormous jurisdictional coverage of the products out there under our jurisdiction. Uh, and I think that's why the, uh, the statute is set up the way it is, that firms have a responsibility uh, when, they, when they have the possibility of a substantial product hazard to report that so-called needle in the haystack of consumer products to us. And it's why the agency's motto for many years, and something I've heard Bob say many times, is when in doubt, report. Uh, you know, by doing that, you are in no way uh, signing up for a recall. Uh, the statistics bear that out. But what you are doing is eliminating the possibility that we will be coming back behind uh, you and looking at whether your reporting was timely. Uh, and, and I do believe that that part of our work is a critical part of making sure that that core part of our overall safety structure, uh, which is so dependent on firms meeting that obligation, uh, is adhered to. And I do expect that that will remain a priority as we move forward. Uh, as Bob referenced, uh, we have had a couple of significant announcements uh, recently, uh, and I you know, expect us to continue to devote resources to that part of our work. Uh, this group is also uh, providing support to our regula regulatory division, which I'll talk about next. Uh, I think their partnership is working together to, uh, really great. Uh, there are often legal issues that come up in their work and complexities that by working together, uh, we, can, uh, we can make things happen in a more robust and efficient way. Uh, and under Jennifer Timian's leadership, uh, working uh, alongside her managers, Sean Keller and Carolyn Manley, this is the orange boxes I'm addressing now. Uh, uh, you know, these are the folks that are working with our port staff and, and getting domestic samples to make sure we're uh, enforcing the specific regulatory performance requirements for those products that have those requirements uh, under our jurisdiction. Uh, like the rest of the organization, uh, you know, they are heightening their attention to e-commerce in light of the tremendous growth in online marketplaces. Uh, from everything from toys to bike helmets to uh, infant durable products. Uh, that will continue to be a focus of compliance in general and regulatory uh, in particular uh, as they work with our import team and uh, with our field staff in 
uh, examining both imported samples as well as domestically gathered samples to make sure that we are uh, uh, taking a hard look at products subject to our regulations. Um, and uh, so that's a, a good segue to talk a little bit about our field team. Uh, and uh, under Bev Cohen's leadership and her deputies, uh, Justin McDonough and Kevin Barton, uh, you know, these folks are supporting all aspects of compliances operations, as well as uh, a lot of our standards work in EXHR through uh, conduct uh, by conducting uh, in-depth investigations of consumer incidents, uh, business inspections, uh, backing up our port team at the ports. Uh, you can see there's a lot of boxes here. That's because these are folks who are stationed around the country, uh, working out of their homes, uh, able to geographically address product safety issues uh, as needed. Uh, a couple of aspects of their work uh, that I wanted uh, uh, to highlight uh, today. Um, uh, in particular, uh, some of the changes we've made with our internet uh, surveillance unit. Uh, which you can see is now a team uh, unto itself uh, within the field under a single manager. Uh, Bob Hull is uh, the manager now taking over that leadership post. Uh, in light of the exponential growth in e-commerce and the important role ISU plays for us, uh, we, we have consolidated them uh, on one single team uh, so that they can both uh, take, uh, implement and plan uh, to help us meet uh, the challenges of e-commerce. Uh, you know, they do a number of things that are important to our e-commerce operation, ranging from uh, surveilling possible violative and recall products uh, online, uh, collecting samples for technical analysis, uh, preserving websites, uh, identifying sellers when sometimes it is not clear on its face from an Internet site uh, who uh, is selling a particular product, as well as conducting analysis of online incidents to help us focus our enforcement activities. Uh, so I expect that group to continue to play a, a leading role um, in uh, helping us address the challenges of e-commerce going forward. I also wanted to uh, point out that our state and local programs office is located uh, in the field under the leadership of, uh, of Denise Beatty. Uh, you know, they work closely with our Office of Communications to coordinate with state and local partners and particularly focus on making sure that our, uh, our safety messaging is getting out to uh, communities around the country, including uh, underserved, uh, under uh, uh, vulnerable population communities, uh, seniors, uh, uh, children, families, uh, particularly in economically challenged uh, areas that may not have ready access to uh, the important safety messaging that the Commission puts out. Uh, with respect to um, uh, with respect to uh, 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 safety uh, that we want uh, consumers around the nation to have, uh, regardless of those circumstances, so a lot going on in compliance. Uh, very appreciative of the support of the commission of, of uh, Mary Boyle and Dwayne Ray and the executive director's office to our changes uh, and to some of the initiatives that are ongoing. Uh, and I'm very excited about. Uh, the progress we've made and the continuing progress I think that we expect to make uh, with some of the changes that we've implemented over the past year. And uh, with that, um, uh, I'll leave it to uh, the folks back there whether to open it up for questions for me now or just move to the next panel and I'd be available to take questions then. Thanks, Rob. And back by popular demand in our next and final C C excuse me, CSPC session, well, a little uh, tongue twister there. Uh, our final session with the CPSC is Ask the CPSC, which we moderated and introduced by D. Wayne Ray, who is a Deputy Executive Director for Operations at the CPSC. D. Wayne, take it away. Thanks, Andy. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's good to be uh, back at ICFASO, even in a different uh, view this time. Um, this morning, I'm honored to uh, moderate this panel of uh, CPSC leaders, and we wanted to uh, spend some time uh, sharing a little bit about our priorities uh, and activities for this year. And then uh, at the end of that session, uh, we'll open it up to questions through the app. I did notice there were some questions already on Rob, so we'll I'll, I'll tee those up uh, for Rob while uh, everyone's going through their um, their talking points 
but I'd like to start off with Dwayne Boniface. Dwayne is our Assistant Executive Director for Hazard Identification Reduction. Dwayne. Good morning, and uh, thank you for the opportunity here. Um, as head of the Office of Hazard Identification and Reduction, EXHR, I've got the advantage of not only a great team, but also a fairly clear target, as much of our work is laid out in the Commission's annual operating plan. I'll highlight a few pieces here. Uh, some of this is going to overlap what the acting chair and uh, the executive director covered this morning, uh, but I'll touch through some of those uh, in any event. Uh, in the area of data, uh, as Mary Boyle noted earlier, we're working on an action plan for the NICE sample modernization. NICE is really a cornerstone for us uh, for our data-driven approach, uh, enabling nationally representative uh, statistical estimates of consumer product injuries. Uh, so we're excited about moving forward with that. Uh, last year, we published data tables from the Clearinghouse Online for uh, uh, download. In the coming weeks, we're going to be introducing a queryable online portable portal that will allow people to access those data uh, more directly and interface with them. In the area of analytics, a lot of great work going on, working to strengthen or expand uh, our analytic capabilities. Uh, included with that, we've added, added Dr. Tony Cassikert. Uh, to the EXHR team as our uh, chief data analytics officer, and we're working to expand our artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities there. Voluntary standards, as was noted earlier, uh, it's a core activity for EXHR and vital for CPSC, allowing us to uh, uh, expand our uh, 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 talent numerically uh, by uh, engaging with uh, key stakeholders, uh, manufacturers, retailers, consumers, and other stakeholders in developing uh, voluntary standards and advancing safety in uh, 78 different areas uh, uh, this year. One recent addition to this area that uh, I wanted to highlight is in the area of artificial intelligence. Uh, here we've added Nevin Taylor to the EXHR team as our chief technologist focusing on artificial intelligence and machine learning in consumer products. And we're hosting a forum on that actually next week, March 2nd. Details are posted on the Federal Register and, uh, and on our website. Uh, in the area of mandatory standards, the acting chair and Mary Boyle covered uh, some of those, but a number of uh, important rulemaking projects this year, including infant sleep products, crib bumpers, furniture tip over, magnets, and window coverings. Uh, product test and evaluation, as Rob noted earlier, we do an awful lot of work in support of the Office of Compliance and in support of JIM and the Office of Import Surveillance, uh, providing a strong technical basis for uh, dealing with unsafe products in the market marketplace. And in the area of technical support, we're working with our partners in OCM to strengthen the information and education campaigns, leveraging the research and analysis that we've done. An example where we uh, have done so we've helped target COVID uh, safety messages on emerging hazard patterns and trends uh, starting in September, uh, summer 2020. So just a brief highlight of things we've, uh, we've got going uh, in fiscal year 21. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, at this point in time, I'd like uh, Jim Jaholski to give an update. Jim is the Director of Office of Import Surveillance. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Dwayne. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, everyone, to at ICFUSO for having me again this year. Um, I wanted to um, talk uh, about three, highlight three uh, priorities that our office is working on right now. Uh, both Mary and Bob uh, mentioned the recent uh, port surveillance legislation that was signed into law at the end of 2020. Uh, we are actively uh, working on very all the aspects of that legislation. In part, the legislation calls for CPSC to maximize our presence at the ports during the during the pandemic. And we are doing that by getting our import staff back at the ports and by increasing our examination of incoming cargo. We are also working very closely with our colleagues in the Field Investigations Division of the Office of Compliance to expand coverage at ports where CPSC does not normally have staff co-located with CBP. So this is really looking to expand our reach in terms of identifying high-risk shipments and being able to do in-person exams. So we really appreciate uh, uh, the, the work with Rob and, and his team to be able to get uh, our domestic field investigators out to the ports. Uh, we are also focused on uh, drafting a report to Congress, uh, which is due to be submitted at the end of June. 
Um, the report's going to cover a lot of ground, and uh, we will include a long-term vision for CPSC's import surveillance program, including how the agency will address the risks associated with e-commerce. Um, some of you may remember that uh, at last year's ICFASO event, I highlighted the research that our office had been doing uh, and the planning that we had been doing around e-commerce. So we really do feel that we are well positioned to put a plan to address de minimis e-commerce shipments in place uh, pretty quickly. Um, another priority, uh, Mary also mentioned the, the uh, recently commission approved e-filing project. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with e-filing, it's a program that will allow CPSC to electronically collect certain data associated with certificates of compliance at the time the entry is a time uh, in entry is filed with CBP. So this data, we really look to uh, enhance our import risk targeting to be able to identify those companies and shipments that present a greater risk uh, so that we can stop them at the ports. Um, E-filing is a, a concept we developed and piloted several years ago uh, and then conducted a follow-up certificate of compliance study. Background documents and all the work that we've done on e-filing are available on our website and would encourage you to take a look at that uh, as part of the, the new initiative that we'll be working on. And the e-filing project we do look at as being a multi-year project. Uh, we will be developing a detailed project plan and, of course, we'll be engaging uh, with you, the trade, and soliciting input throughout the process. And the third area that I'd like to address briefly is our ongoing deployment and development of functionality uh, in our RAM system that will facilitate communication with uh, Customs and Border Protection in the trade. Um, this includes two, two main items, uh, electronic messaging that we have put in place with uh, CBP and with Customs Brokers that allows us to more efficiently uh, coordinate hold requests and exams at the ports. And then we have some upcoming functionality that's in uh, development now that will allow us to electronically transmit import related forms and requests for information to the trade. So we're excited about both of those and we do, help, do think that they will help us become more efficient and effective. Uh, so those are, uh, uh, that's a brief overview of some of our big priorities uh, for this year. Um, and I hope uh, everyone uh, stays safe and healthy and I'll turn it back over to Dwayne. Thanks, Jim. Um, now I'd like to introduce Jen Sultan, who is our acting general counsel for any opening comments. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you heard earlier from Mary Boyle, I am currently serving in the acting general counsel position. Um, Gabe Mullen recently, recently retired. And uh, just some of the sort of priorities for us are ensuring a smooth transition during this time. Um, also making sure to provide the necessary legal support for some of the priorities that you heard um, discussed earlier today. And then also me personally, just given my um, role in compliance as the deputy to ensure and to foster you know, continued collaboration between OGC and, e and compliance in particular, but of course with all the other parts of the agency. And just for some very broad brushstrokes, what does OGC do? Um, at a very high level, we provide legal support for rulemakings. We provide legal support for matters that are referred to DOJ, um, also defensive litigation, including challenges to rulemakings. And also we provide agency-wide legal support on general law, FOIA, um, jurisdictional, statutory, and regulatory determinations. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Rob, I know you uh, you introduced yourself on the last slide. If there's anything else you wanted to add before we go to questions, I'm happy to have you say anything. Uh, thanks, Dwayne. No, I think I, I think I'm ready to to, to hear the questions. <laughs> Okay. Well, great. Uh, well, first one's teed off for you. Um, uh, will, will you make the CPSC compliance organizational chart available in the ICFASO material as CPSC always used to do? It's very useful. 
Yeah, I, I don't see any reason why uh, why we wouldn't. Uh, uh, you know, I, we want people to understand, you know, where the folks they're dealing with fit into the organization. Uh, and I, I, I think, assuming we've done that in the past, and it doesn't present any um, uh, uh, information sharing issues, which I don't think it does, be happy uh, happy to do that. And this one's a little variant on that, Rob. CPSC used to publish a directory of various staff in their areas of responsibility. This helps get information. Why stop? How can we find such information? Uh, you know, I'm happy to look into that. One of the things that we did uh, when we did the reorganization or the restructuring uh, was in our uh, in our new enforcement and litigation division in particular. Uh, you know, folks are are a little less prod are less product specific in terms of the nature of the work that they're doing. Um, uh, uh, the uh, the substantial products hazard standard is a broad one, and we found people are work can work very effectively across a range of product. Uh, we are still more uh, uh, product specific in terms of our organization in the regulatory section, uh, and uh, you know, happy to look into how we can make those folks' specialties uh, available uh, if that would be helpful to to folks. Okay, I'm going to try to pick one for Dwayne Boniface uh, just to give Rob a break for a minute. Um, uh, let me make sure. Why is staff not able to answer questions on experimental testing and results during active rulemaking would be helpful during standard development? Uh, yes, good, good question. We uh, often share results as they are as they become uh, available. Uh, uh, a, a key part of that, though, is, is sort of when does that work uh, complete? And so as we're in a rulemaking process for, for some of these areas, uh, we're continuing to analyze the results. Uh, and so the, the research doesn't really finish until we're uh, putting the, uh, the results of that effort uh, uh, forward, typically in a uh, briefing package to the commission. Okay. Uh, we got a few more here. Uh, this one, um, I believe, is on proposed legislation, COVID legislation. Um, this one might be a gin question. Um, please comment on, and we may not be able to answer all of this, the provisions in the COVID legis legislation, what these products are, and how they are distinct from FDA or EPA FIFRA regulated products. It's not clear from this question if this is about um, if this is what are COVID products. So I think there's a little bit more that's missing from the actual question. Um, but to the extent that you know there's a question about what does a definition mean, I believe there's some definitions in this legislation to refer to. So I'm sorry I can't do a better job here, but there may be some interpretation that will happen even with or without definitions. Okay. All right, we're back to uh, we're back to Rob again. Will fast track still involve weeks or months of iterative, non-substantive exchanges that only serve to delay recalls? Boy, that, that's that, that's not a very friendly question, Dwayne. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, I can I say it friendlier. Will fast track be faster? <laughs> You know, clearly, despite the fact that that sometimes people think that government tries to work to a bureaucratic reputation, that really is couldn't be further from the truth. And the whole portal project is geared towards trying to streamline and uh, and and uh, standardize and use technology to avoid uh, those kinds of pitfalls. Uh, I can't promise, especially as we start rolling, that there won't be um, uh, bumps in the road for us to work past. But clearly, the goal is to make things uh, as unified, streamlined, and, and absent of those kinds of things as we can. Okay. Jim Jaholski, I'm looking for one for you, but I, I don't, no, one, no one's asking him yet. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
Uh, this one, I think, is really kind of a rough one. Again, same CPSC is shifting its policy on scope of information submitted pursuant to Section 15. Please explain CPSC's policy and how it is within agency authority. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the, the, the question. I don't think we intend as part of the fast track uh, portal to, to in any way uh, change uh, policy with respect to disclosure, you know, absent uh, legislative change or a, a significant policy change, which I would expect would be communicated. I, I think the information will still be treated uh, in the same way, uh, albeit submitted uh, uh, electronically. Do you think that got okay. at the question or? Yeah, I, it's hard to, without uh, actually having a little bit more detail on there. Uh, let's see uh, this one. Given CPSC's trouble history of protecting confidential information, should it be more judicious and demands for things like consumer PII and medical info? I think that's along the same lines of Section 15 questions for you, Rob. Well, you know, I, I think it's 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 fair to say, I think it's and it's accurate to say that CPSC is an agency that in part because of of Section 6B uh, takes, you know, its responsibilities, you know, uh, with respect to information uh, uh, protection when appropriate, uh, very, very seriously. Uh, you know, to the extent that there have been any issues, I know that the there's been extensive efforts to address them. Uh, and I think that, you know, it remains a priority for us to do all of our activities lawfully in accordance with, with the law. Uh, there is information that we require in compliance uh, and which our regulations and the statute make clear uh, firms are obligated to provide, including consumer information so, such that we can uh, properly investigate incidents. Uh, and, you know, we do expect firms to provide that information while at the same time uh, you know, we hold ourselves to the standards of protecting information required uh, by our, our statute. Okay. Um, looks like uh, we've got um, another one on, uh, well, this one, I maybe, um, how does Continuing uncertainty in commission slots affect staff morale and effectiveness. Um, does anybody on the panel want to take that one on? Rob, you've been doing all the talking. Happy to open it up to anybody else on the group. Yeah, I can. I can jump in. I. I, I think that uh, certainly, as uh, Mary Boyle noted in in her remarks, we've had a tremendous amount of churn over the last year. Uh, uh, as staff have dealt with uh, uh, both personal and uh, CPSC impacts of the uh, coronavirus epidemic, uh, certainly the uh, uh, the gaps of the commission uh, uh, add to that. Okay, we have one for Jim. Jim Jaholski, uh, what? Does your team have the ability to search for more than lead in tracking label violations? What other kind of uh, violations are they looking for? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, we do. We're, we're looking for basically our approach is anything that we can identify at the ports uh, where we can make a screening determination that there's a pen potential violation then um, that's in play for our investigators to look at. So lead is a big one. We have an XRF device that is uh, really uh, a great screening tool um, for us to be able to detect lead. We have an FTIR device that we use for phthalates. Um, we are also looking and screening for uh, ASTM F963 violations. Um, we are looking for other types of regulated violations, lighters, bike helmets, um, um, uh, 15J rules as well, the 415J rules. So it's a wide breadth of things that we're looking for. In the end, our philosophy, though, is if we are screening a product uh, looking for a significant violation, 
Um, but we determine as part of that examination that a product has not been certified or does not have a tracking label, we do feel an obligation to move forward um, and, and document that and, uh, and refer that over to the Office of Compliance for, uh, for evaluation. So, um, you know, I think we do not see the level uh, the high levels of lead uh, uh, PPM violations that we had seen early on after CPSIA, uh, but we do we do still detect those those violations and take action on them. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, I'm going to keep you there while while your mic's hot. Um, are there any specific parts of the country or types of import activities where you guys are planning to staff up? Yeah, I think the, the recent uh, uh, port surveillance legislation makes it clear that Congress wants us to focus on de minimis e-commerce shipments. So I see as resources become available that we will be expanding to uh, places where e-commerce uh, arrives. So that's going to be your large express uh, carrier hubs. Those are going to be other uh, large airports where high volumes of e-commerce arrive plus international mail facilities as well. So those staffing up in those locations is part of, is going to be part of our plans. In addition to, as again, as resources become available, uh, continuing to um, increase staffing at what we call sort of traditional ports of entry, where your containerized cargo is coming into the country. These would be seaports, um, uh, truck crossings, uh, some airports as well. Uh, we will be looking to expand in those locations as well. So really an overall uh, plan to, to grow the import surveillance division uh, office. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, this one's for Dwayne. What can we expect at the upcoming AI forum next week? Uh, great question, and uh, appreciate the interest. We've got, uh, we've really got a, uh, an exciting slate of uh, topics and speakers for that. Uh, I think uh, there are many on this uh, on this webinar that are participating. Uh, uh, we've got uh, NIST coming in to talk about uh, uh, policies and guidelines that they've been working on. Uh, we've got some academic presentations uh, uh, from Penn State, Harvard, and the University of Nevada talking about uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, its use, and the application of standards. Uh, European Commission uh, doing the same. Uh, we've got consumer groups coming in to help talk. And then we've got uh, groups such as Underwriters Laboratories, Bureau of Veritas, uh, and others coming in to talk about the uh, sort of the nuts and bolts. How do we deal with uh, this new technology? Uh, how does it impact our uh, testing work? How does it impact? Or how should it impact our standards development and so forth? So, really, an exciting day laid out. I, I do hope that uh, as many people uh, attend that as can. Okay, uh, this this question is for uh, Jim. Does the report to Congress include recommendations from CPSC as to how e-commerce only platforms will be brought into the same obligations as brick and mortar? No, I, I think that's going to be outside the scope of what uh, Congress is asking us to do um, as part of the report. I mean, there are several aspects of what we need to respond to in the report. Uh, that That is not one of them. It's mainly going to be looking back at um, kind of what what the agency did uh, during COVID, uh, when, especially when we did not have staff uh, at the ports for a period of time, and uh, a big focus on uh, what our future plans are to address de minimis. Uh, but I don't believe that that is going to be one aspect that we will be um, uh, dealing with in the report. Okay. Uh, Rob, this one uh, is an enforcement question. What are the enforcement plans for COVID-related products? The new non-medical mask standard and products like paint sprayers being repurposed as disinfectant. Yeah, you know, I, I, I 
don't think I can answer the question with respect to any specific product. What I can say is that, you know, our, our regulatory work is always uh, focused on a risk-based uh, uh, manner, wanting to look at products that present heightened risk. And certainly to the extent COVID has introduced uh, new products or has led to some products to be much more widely consumed, uh, you know, that's something that we want to look at and that I expect we will look at uh, as as we continue to uh, uh, move through this COVID period. Okay. Uh, kind of on that theme, Dwayne, uh, with the recent publication of ASTM F3502 barrier face mask, does CPSC foresee enacting this voluntary standards mandatory? <laughs> Uh, certainly, it's something we'll look at. I, I would note that the that uh, ASTM standard does incorporate some of CPSC's regulations on the flammability piece, uh, uh, 1610 and 6 uh, in particular. Um, so there's already uh, some uh, 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 regulatory uh, uh, overlap there, uh, but we'll take a look at uh, at that. Much of that standard is focused on. Uh, issues outside of our jurisdiction, though. Okay. Uh, Rob, this is uh, another compliance question. Is why does CPSC refuse to share PSAs with companies? Uh, wouldn't sharing promote quicker resolution and due process? That's a great, I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, there are reasons related to potential administrative litigation that we don't share the PSA. That does not mean that we were trying to hide the ball in any way with respect to our technical conclusions. Uh, we frequently will provide uh, written summaries of what's in PSAs and, and have often made technical staff available to firms uh, to ask questions about our conclusions. Uh, it is not our intention because I agree with the premise of the question that when there's an information uh, sharing going on where everybody is 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 aware of of the, the uh, you know a common platform of facts and and each side's assessment of those facts, uh, I think that does hasten uh, decision making on both sides and and it is our intention to do that uh, with the hope that we can reach resolution uh, in in cases that have evolved to that point. All right, we've got a few more minutes here. Um, seems like, Rob, you're very popular um, on this uh, question list. So uh, let me try this one. Can a manufacturer report via email on 15B if portal information is not available? Otherwise, it may cause a, port, a uh, reporting delay. I'm not sure exactly what it means by uh, portal information being unavailable. Uh, with respect to the initial reporting component of the portal, uh, you know, we're aiming to uh, to do that in a way that would facilitate, uh, uh, you know, a report even when uh, limited information is available. Uh, uh, and I think that that's something that uh, we've had focus on and would welcome further comment on at our at, at our feedback session uh, with respect to that. Uh, I do think it's important that we don't do anything that would make it harder for firms to uh, submit initial reports when they think they may have identified a safety problem. Uh, you know, that's definitely not the intention of the new portal. Yeah, and I, I guess I kind of read it a little bit as um, if the portal's having problems, can you email it still um, as kind of like a backup? And I don't think we uh, discourage that, but I think we're trying to encourage the use of the portal so that it is, um, you know, in through that system and getting the information together to act on. What we all know from, from our experiences over the last year, the technology never fails. So uh, you can always count on the technological submission, uh, but I'm, I'm sure that in the event that that's not available, we'll have some alternative means. Uh, uh, but again, we are trying to bring us into a 21st century technologically based system. Great. Well, I think we are uh, at the end of our time. I appreciate um, my uh, fellow uh, panelists here and uh, presenting and ask, asking these uh, good questions. 
I think at this point, um, we're done from our CPSC uh, day presentations and uh, thank everyone for uh, engaging. Thank you to all the CPSC participants. We certainly appreciate the time and effort you took to be here and participate with all the product safety stakeholders. If you have any additional questions, please send to sbo at cpsc.gov and they will be directed to the appropriate office.